In the beginning, there was naught but chaos and void. Nothing filled the space of existence. Even existence itself was yet to be. Until one single phrase was uttered by a truly all-powerful being beyond comprehension. Galaxy Impact! And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the story of how Monkey D. Garp created the universe with his mighty fist. So every time you look up at the sky, or down at the ground, or even at yourself, because aren't we all made out of the universe? Which means there's a little bit of Garp in each and every one of us. Thank you, Garp. Thanks for everything. <laughs> this has been Story Time with Old Man Teching. Signing out. Where am I? Okay, this is insane. Barry, you might have some competition. Up until recently, I was under the impression that Barry had kick-started the universe through sheer physical force, but now that we've seen what Garp is capable of, I'm not really sure about that. Galaxy Impact! Oh man, that's gonna be the new hip thing to say. Galaxy Impact! You know how, like, um, fellow 90s kids, if there's any fellow 90s kids in here, uh, you would play Dragon Ball Z with your friends in the backyard. Don't laugh, you, you know, you play Dragon Ball Z just like everyone else did in the 90s. Um, you know, everyone's doing Kamehameha and everything. That'll be, it'll be Galaxy Impact for a new generation. Alright, so, um, let's break this down, um, let, let, let's look at this, let's analyze this. This. Um, let's look at the math of this situation right here. Let's think about this. What does this mean for the future of the One Piece story? It means Garp can obliterate an entire town with a single punch. That's what it means, which really everybody should have assumed that already. And honestly, once again, I have to reiterate this point. At the end of the last chapter, when Garp brings down the fist... We see the impact beginning. We see all of the buildings in the surrounding area in that courtyard where all of the pirates were, like, forced into. We, we see that just being decimated and blown away. Um, but that is probably not the entirety of that attack. It, it looks like a shockwave with Garp at the epicenter. You know, like, he's above the island launching the attack, and then the explosion is radiating outwards, okay? Which was the reason why I was a little scared for Kobe's well-being here, right? Because... Kobe was, like, in the center of that courtyard. Hibari shows up, shoots the, the flower bullets, you know, the flower gunpowder bullets the Vegapunk invented. So I'm assuming, you know, Kobe managed to escape with Hibari. Prince Groose was also there with his golems, and then Kujaku was also there whipping the buildings. And so I'm like, did, did they all get out of there okay? Because just simply, like... Like, uh, like, getting out of the immediate vicinity of the courtyard, I don't think that's going to really help you very much. This shockwave is going to boom, you know? Like, it's going to get out there, okay? Um... Now, it's very possible that, like, you know, Kobe and Habari could have gotten away. The Prince Groose that we saw in the chapter, he was pretty close to the courtyard, but he might have been a golem for all we know. He might have used his devil fruit to create a golem of himself that could then therefore create more golems. Very possible. So the, the real Prince Groose could be somewhere else. Kujaku, we saw her whipping the buildings, but she could have ran away well before that, okay? Um, but, dude, uh, also, here's another question. How did the, the ship get flung into the air? I made a joke where Garp like sneezed and that propelled the ship but in reality like is that really what happened or was there another way to get them up there um I'm trying to think. I mean there could always be another member of sword that we don't know about yet that has some ability um Fujitora I think some people actually posited what if uh Fujitora was on the ship because he has the Zushi Zushi no me the gravity fruit so what if what if he's there honestly I could see Fujitora working with Garp I could see Fujitora definitely aligning with the um the idea 
ideals of sword and like working alongside Garp to bring down one of the uh, Yonko. Absolutely, right? Uh, even if, even if, let's say what Aokiji said about sword was accurate, which I don't think it was. I think it was some of it was accurate and some of it he was stretching the truth to try to save Kobe because I'm pretty sure that you know. Aokiji is in sword. I think it's pretty obvious, right? So, even if it's that the case, I could still see Fujitora just being like, I don't care about protocols. I don't care about putting in my resignation. I mean, Fujitora would probably do it, but he's an admiral, so it's like different kind of status with that. So, I can imagine if, if it's for the greater good, you know, whatever uh, consequence be damned, Fujitora would do it, okay? Now, that's just a theory on whether or not Fujitora was on the ship. Garp might have very well have just, all right, hold tight, Helmeppo, hold tight, Tashigi. I'm gonna lift up my ship, throw it at the island, rush to the other side of the ship, jump off, and then cause a <laughs> cause an ICB Garp on the island. I saw that in the comments. Somebody was like, that wasn't an ICBM. That was an ICBG. <laughs> Intercontinental Ballistic Garp. You know, like, I love that comment. That was a good one. That was a good one. Oh my god, they're so great. It's so awesome. Um, here's something else I wanted to bring up, because I'm just, I'm just so happy right now, okay? When you think about some of the strongest characters in One Piece, and I'm talking top tier, okay? Like, we're talking about, like, the Rogers of the One Piece world, all right? Even characters like Roger who are dead, you know, like, they're, like, the very strongest, the pinnacle of strength in the One Piece universe that we know about, okay? There are quite a few characters um, that actually have no Devil Fruit abilities, and their strength is you know, purely tied to their, um, you know, their fighting skill with, like, a weapon and their hockey, and that's it, okay? But when you look at the list of the strongest One Piece characters without Devil Fruits, I want to say that as a caveat, without Devil Fruit powers, you got an interesting list. You got Shanks, who uses a sword. You got Mihawk, who uses a sword. You got Rayleigh, who's not as strong as he used to be, but when he was in his prime, he used a sword. You got Roger, who's dead, but he used a sword. You got Scopper Gabon, who is the third seat, not the third seat, that's Bleach, uh, the third mate, I guess, second mate of whatever of Roger's crew. He used axes, right? Um, but then you get to, uh, to Garp, who's also in that kind of class. I guess Sengoku as well. All right, I forgot about Sengoku. All right, Sengoku. Sengoku, but Sengoku has a Devil Fruit. That was the exception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sengoku has a Devil Fruit. When it comes to really powerful characters in One Piece that do not have Devil Fruits, they almost always fight with a sword. You know, in, in Scopper's case, he fights with an axe, but pretty much everybody fights with a sword. We don't know how Rocks fought. We don't even know if Rox had a Devil Fruit, might have had a Devil Fruit, might have fought with a sword, probably fought with a sword. Most people fight with a sword, except for Garp. I just wanted to bring this up as just to bring it to everyone's attention that Garp is one of the strongest characters in this entire story. He don't need a devil fruit, and he doesn't even need a weapon. These are his weapons right here. You know, these hands are all Garp needs, okay? This and just a astronomical Herculean amount of Conqueror's Hockey. That is all Garp needs. And his milk. You know, Garp drinks like 10 gallons of milk and just glug, glug, glug. All right, let's go. That's what actually fear, uh, fuels Conqueror's Hockey in the One Piece world, in case you didn't know. That's how you recharge your hockey. Just drink a lot of milk. That's, that's actually canon, right? People have asked me, like, all right, well, hyperbole aside, teching. Garp could still lose this. I look at that and I'm just like, well, yeah, sure, he's an old man in a shonen manga. Uh, the odds are definitely not in his favor right now, you know what I mean? The odds are not in his favor, just looking at the track record of other shonen manga, we have a scene near the end of the story where a badass old man with crazy power shows up and has a moment to show off and then, and then it doesn't really go well for them after that, they end up dying, okay? I'm hoping that Oda spins it in a way where it's at least different, okay? So, if Blackbeard does not show up on this island somehow, uh, I find it very hard to believe that Garp is going to get, you know, defeated here at Hachinosu. From the group of uh, Blackbeard's crew that we know are on the island, we know for a fact that Vasco's there, we know San Juan's there, we know Shiryu is there, and we know Avala Pizarro is there, okay? Now, we have not seen Lafitte or Katarina Davon. They are still unaccounted for, uh, I guess as well as Aokiji, who at this point, I think it's pretty much obvious that Aokiji, on top of being a member of S.W.O.R.D., is also 
the 10th Titanic captain. He's there hanging out in the meetings with Blackbeard and the other 10 Titanic captains. It, it's pretty obvious that Kuzon is the 10th one. Hasn't been confirmed yet, but that's the situation there. So we don't know where, where he's at. We do know that uh, Augur, Burgess, and uh, Doc Hugh, Stronger, and Blackbeard himself are at Wiener Island fighting against Law. And then, then there's another Blackbeard ship heading toward Egghead right now. So is that ship just Kuzon? Is it Kuzon going to go and uh, check on Vegapunk and maybe help him out, maybe help the Straw Hats? Or is it uh, Lafitte and Katarina Davon? Or is it Kuzon, Lafitte, and Katarina that are all heading to the island together? Okay, so the Blackbeard Pirates are definitely on the move right now, right? Well, I have to say, even with the Devil Fruits that we learned that the Blackbeard crew have on Hachi Nosu, with Pizarro having the island fruit, we already knew San Juan had some kind of gigantification devil fruit ability, the big, big fruit. Um, which, by the way, the idea for that is, I think it was said at one point that San Juan Wolf's maximum height is 180 meters, which is insane, okay? It's way, way taller than Ors or Wadatsume or any other largest, like, you know, like, you know, I think the Kraken might be bigger. Zunisha's obviously way bigger. Zunisha's like 35 kilometers tall. But when it comes to characters that have like a humanoid shape, like humanoids, it's, that's pretty big, right? Um, so 180 meters was stated to be his maximum height. I don't know if that's like canon or just something that was mentioned in a Viva card. But if that's the case, that's his maximum. It's possible that his Devil Fruit is able to increase his size up until 10 times. Like 10 times his original base size, which San Juan is already a giant. That would actually make a lot of sense because that would put his base size at 18 meters, which is like right in the middle of like the average for a giant. Because we know the shortest giants are 12 meters. Um, you know, Dory and Broggy were, I think, a little taller than average. They were like, you know, 20, 21 meters, something like that. So for San Juan being 18 meters is kind of like right in the middle of like standard for a giant um, you know and so then using the gigantification for the big big fruit he can inflate up to 10 times that size to 180 meters that would make a lot of sense now 180 meters that's really tall but once again, I'm not really worried for Garp. I'm not worried that Pizarro can turn into an island. I'm not worried that Shiryu can turn invisible. I'm not worried that Vasco can control liquor and maybe, like, light things on fire with that. I'm, I'm really not worried about any of those abilities. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not to say that any of those abilities are necessarily weak. And, of course, the Blackbeard crew is a Yonko crew. They're all very powerful. If this was any other character, like, let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. If Garp was not part of this raid on Hachinosu right now, if it was everybody else, if Tashigi, Kobe, Hibari, Prince Cruz, Kujaku, if they were all there, but Garp wasn't, I would be fearful. I would be afraid. I would see this as like, okay, they launched a surprise attack. They were able to take advantage of that. Um, but now the fight is on because in the last chapter, we didn't really see... You know, we did not see any of the 10 Titanic captains getting involved in the fight. It was all just the, the riffraff pirates, okay? So, yeah, the fact that Pizarro can turn into an island, that's a big deal. But Garp is there. Garp could totally obliterate an island. He kind of, like, here's a question. Was the galaxy impact that he used last chapter, was that even Garp at 100%? That Was that really Garp, like, I'm going to open this up with the strongest move at 100% capacity? Galaxy Impact! You know, was that that? Now, granted, yes, Garp is no longer at the top of his game. He's an older man, right? Um, I even saw a comment that was like, hey, are you sure Garp is not at his peak now? Who's to say he can't be at his peak when he's in his 70s? And that's an interesting way of looking at it. However, it's already been confirmed um, by a few characters. I know Don Chin Zhao said that uh, Garp in his prime was like a demon to all the pirates in the world. And I believe it was also hinted at when Sengoku was telling the story to the Marines about Roger and Garp fighting against rocks that um, that was Garp in, like, in his prime, okay? And so, yeah. Yeah, he's definitely still really powerful, but he's not in his absolute prime anymore. I would say he was around 39 years old when he fought rocks at God Valley with Roger. I, I would say like around the 40s, that's usually, you know, peak level in the One Piece world, provided you don't have random anime sickness disease like, like Roger did, right? So, um... But was that like Garp, like his, like, I'm just going to open the proceedings with my absolute strongest attack as powerful as I can make it? I would argue... I would argue no... It wasn't the strongest. If you think it was, that's fine. But I don't know. Maybe this is just me riding the Garp hype as high as it can go. And I am. But I'm just saying that, like, 
if Garp, because, like, he was attacking, this was a planned attack. This was, like, you know, move all the buildings around, corral everybody into the center of Hachinosu, get Kobe out of there, and then Garp jumps in and he attacks all the pirates at once, eliminating them in one go, okay? If Garp wanted to ratchet up the damage of that attack a bit and maybe deal even more collateral damage and maybe even annihilate the island, um... Like, we saw what he was capable of in the last chapter. So the idea that, like, yeah, Garp could obliterate an entire town with a single punch, but the idea he could obliterate an entire island with a single punch, or maybe, like, he could obliterate an entire island with two punches! That's ridiculous. No, clearly it's not ridiculous. Clearly, if Garp was like, all right, I will bust out my ultimate... Two fists! Boom! You know, I like, that could, like, obliterate an island, like, I mean, maybe not every island, you know, but Hachinosu is not the largest island in One Piece, right? So, mm, I don't think that was Garp at full power. I don't think that was Garp. He was definitely trying. It wasn't like, oh, I'm just gonna play around with these. You know, if he was just gonna play around with the pirates, he would have just used, like, one pinky, <laughs> you know, like, he would have just used that. But no, he was definitely trying, but to say that that was... It's kind of like looking at Shanks, in a, you know, in the chapter before that. Like, was that Kamusari that Shanks used? He was serious. He was trying to kill Kid. But was that the strongest attack that Shanks had in his repertoire, used at 100% max power? I don't think so, right? And I kind of think of the same thing here with Garp, okay? So... Um, a lot of people were commenting, like, remember, uh, back at the scene at Marineford when Sengoku had to hold down Garp after Akainu killed Ace? You can kind of see that now. Um, I talked about this on the stream, the post-chapter stream I did, but uh, I was basically like, well, you know, at that point in the story when Akainu was very wounded after getting cracked in the skull by Whitebeard and on also the fact that Garp really wasn't battle damaged at all, Garp didn't really have any injuries at that point. Like, if it was Garp pretty much at full power versus Akainu very wounded at that point, um, I, I could see Garp taking the W on that. I, I could. I, I, I genuinely could. Plus, not only that, but Garp was relatively at full strength and... And he was in rage mode after Akainu just murdered his grandson. Uh, basically his grandson, you know. And so, yeah, you could see Garp just rage mode and just decimating Akainu right there. So it was a good thing Sengoku held him back right there. Okay. So another thing is this really should just paint a, a general image here. And this might be what Oda's going for. And this is what I mean by... There might be a way Oda to spin this, okay? Where we know that Roger and Garp in their prime were needed to fight together to bring down Rox and his crew. Now, people have mentioned that it wasn't just Rox and Garp by them. I mean, it wasn't just Garp and Roger versus Rox by themselves, like the three of them. You also have to account for all of the other Rox pirates. You know, Whitebeard was there, Big Mom, Kaido, Wang G! Silver Axe, Shiki, Captain John, everybody was there, okay? But you also have to remember, yeah, they were all there, but I would imagine Roger's whole crew was there as well. I would imagine Rayleigh and Scopper and 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 everybody was there, you know, right? Millet Pine, Sunbell, they were all there as well. Um, Garp probably had his, you know, um, it, now I'm not saying that like Garp had like his, his platoon in particular was like, you know, every single one of them was crazy powerful, but like, you know, Garp in his prime with his ship, I'm sure like his second in command, like Bogard might have been at God Valley for all we know. And you don't want to mess with Bo Bogard, you know what I mean? So like, yeah, I'm sure Garp had some strong people with him. I'm sure Roger had his crew with him and then fighting together against rocks. But what I like to think of, and this could be proven wrong, it totally could. But I like to think what it came down to at God Valley was Roger and Garp two versus one and the one being rocks i also like to think at a certain point during god valley uh whitebeard basically didn't he didn't betray rocks but he basically left uh, maybe whitebeard was just like screw this i'm out of here i'm not dying you know what i mean i'm leaving and maybe big mom maybe that was the downfall of the rocks crew at the end of the day because they always talk about how the rocks crew was this uh they, they were always fighting with one another they were the furthest thing from friends or family or nakama and they were just this motley crew that was barely being held together so what if that was their downfall 
What if when the shit was getting rough and then Roger and Garp were rolling up to God Valley and then was everything was hitting the fan? What if uh, maybe the Rocks crew fought together for a little while, but then they decided, screw this, we're not, we're out, match, we're out of here. Big Mom leaves, Kaido leaves, he gets the dragon fruit, Whitebeard leaves because he doesn't want to die, they just all get out, they all just abandon Rocks. And then it's just rocks on the island by himself. Maybe he's just too obstinate to just give up and retreat. So he's like, my crew abandoned me. Who cares? I'll take you on. You know what I mean? And then it was Garp and Roger that was still required to bring down rocks in that final battle. That's what I picture it as, okay? Had the rocks crew been a family, had the rocks crew all fought together like a perfect engine of devastation, maybe they would have been able to be strong enough to defeat Roger and Garp there. But maybe they're fighting, they're, they were not fighting together, and they all just broke apart, and then it was just Rox v. Garp and Roger, and that was it. Now, here's where the twist comes from, okay? We're dealing with a lot of Rox stuff in, in One Piece, and it makes me wonder how Oda's gonna handle that. Is Oda going to handle this with, turns out Rox was never dead, and he's gonna show up? Is it gonna turn out to be some kind of revival thing, like... You know, we know Gecko Moria was captured there, and we know Moria has the power to resurrect corpses. So what if they have Rox's corpse and they bring it back as a zombie? But then maybe there's like something else with that. Um, you know, like I'm trying to think of the way to make this work. Like it's it's very possible Rox could have had the Yami Yami Nomi and then Blackbeard, because there's a lot of connections between Blackbeard and Rocks. Now, whether those connections are more of like, you know, the more of like the way that there's connections between Luffy and Roger. There's a lot of parallels between Luffy and Roger, like the inherited will, that's a big theme of One Piece. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that, you know, Roger was a swordsman, so Luffy has to be a swordsman too. That's not how I, I mean it. Um, in the same way, just because, you know, Blackbeard has the Yami Yami does not mean that Rocks had it as well, but there's a lot of parallels here, so I have to wonder what direction are we going with this? Are we, because the way that I'm thinking about it and the way that Oda is setting it up, especially when we first learned about rocks, when Blackbeard, uh, not Blackbeard, when uh, Garp was talking about it at the Reverie and he was saying that, like, if the rocks pirates ever came back in full force right now, like a force to be reckoned with like that, we would really be out of luck. We would be outgunned. Now, you could look at that like, does that mean literally, like, the rocks crew, or at least rocks himself, is going to come back at some point? And that's going to be, like, the final opponent? Or is it going to be, like, Blackbeard's crew is going to rise to the level of Rocks D. Zebek? And that is the threat that we have to worry about. Something like that. Um, there's a lot of talk about Blackbeard, of course, having, like, multiple personalities and all that. What if one of them, maybe he has a split personality and that personality is Rocks in some way? Um, I'm not sure. But I have to say, if Blackbeard arrives on the island through Augur's warping ability, if that's how the warping ability works. If Augur can just teleport Teach back to Hachinosu, and then we have Garp facing down Blackbeard. Rematch this time, because they fought very briefly at Marineford. Still don't know how they were able to get away from that, but still, whatever. It's Garp v. Blackbeard, okay? The man that pretty much did result in the death of Ace for capturing him, okay? So, and then what if it's some weird shit that happens, similar to, like, how Shanks got the scar, where Garp, I mean, uh, Blackbeard did something to attack Shanks, and he got the scar, and, you know, Shanks wasn't being careless or anything, it's just something happened. So what if he uses the same ability there to get the one-up on Garp? Uh, and what if this has something to do with Zebek? If it was done like that, and I, I would still not want Garp to die, like, if you're gonna go that route with it, I could see, like, Garp is just knocking heads at Hachinosu, boom, knock down San Juan Wolf, boom, knock out Pizarro. He might have already knocked out Pizarro, if Pizarro can feel everything that's happening to the island, and Garp just, boom, he might just gut-punched Pizarro. But Garp is just, you know, stomping through the island, wiping out everybody. The other members of S.W.O.R.D. are there to help him. I still want to see Bogard. I hope Bogard's on that ship. Tashigi's on the ship, so Smoker might be on the ship. We just see everybody just decimating the island. And then all of a sudden, it's like Blackbeard gets warped there. And then he's facing off against Garp. And then Blackbeard does something to, like, attack Garp. And it, like, bypasses, like, any defense, any hockey, any ability. And we, that is how we get to see how dangerous Blackbeard is. Because there's always been this underlying thing with Blackbeard. Like, don't underestimate him. 
y you know, he's got some tricks up his sleeve, something that really can't be dodged or avoided, something that's beyond the realm of reason. The fact that he's able to have more than one devil fruit in and of itself is a fact of that. So if we're going with the multiple personality or the multiple soul kind of theory that exists with Blackbeard lore, um, it's very possible that like, oh, he's there one minute and, you know, you're locked on to him with observation hockey. Like, I know he's there. And then all of a sudden something else could happen from behind you that's completely like, or he goes to attack you and you block the attack and then the fist just goes through and punches you anyway. Something like that. That just It would have to bypass observation and armament hockey, you know, be able to punch through that. Um, but even in that case, I, I think there's still a way to write the story without Garp dying. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, okay, Blackbeard shows up, fights against Garp, and he manages to deal a crushing blow to Garp. Not enough to kill him, but enough for, you know, him to be injured, and then Garp, boom, punches Blackbeard to the ground, and so they're both severely wounded. But the whole reason why Garp was there to rescue Kobe, so like, oh, okay, Garp, we got Kobe, let's get out of here. Like, all right, and then they get out of there and escape, and then we get to see at least, without Garp dying, we at least get to see the danger that Blackbeard poses and, like, the abilities that he has, okay, where he can even stagger Garp. All right, and then maybe Garp goes off, and then we get to see something else with him, and I, I just don't want Garp to die. Look, look, look. I don't feel like it's necessary for Garp to die. I don't feel like in every shonen it's necessary to have the old mentor character die at some point. It's one of those tropes that's just overused so much. I feel like I feel like Oda's going to go a different direction with that. I feel like okay, just because you have an old mentor figure in shonen doesn't mean they absolutely have to die in order for the main character to be motivated. You can go other roads with this, okay? I just, I just, whenever a trope is overused a lot, I really like to see an author that like, okay, we're going to do this a different way now, okay? I appreciate that. I genuinely do, okay? Also, it makes the story just less predictable, you know what I mean? It's, it's very easy to look at this scene that's playing on Hachinosu right now and just say to yourself, okay, Garp's the old mentor figure, he's the old guard, he's showing up, he's doing something really cool, that means he's got to die. And that's predictable. If Garp were to die right here in Hachinosu, I'm sure that Oda would write it in a very tearful way, and it would be like, No, Garp, stay with us! Damn you, Blackbeard! You know, it'd be something like that, sure, and I would be emotional about it, but it would also be very predictable. I'd be like, oh, saw that coming, but still sad, but I saw it coming. I, I think Oda could do something better with that. But what do you guys think? <laughs> what do you all think? Let me know in the comments down below and all that nonsense. All right, moving on to turtle facts today. Still don't have an intro for it, so, <clears throat> you know, time for some uh, turtle facts. Time for some, yeah, turtle facts. We're going to talk about turtle facts. Actually, tortoise facts, more than likely. Wait, there was a thing I was going to say yesterday in the turtle facts. It was all tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises. I, I think that's how it works. Anyway, because we all know that uh, turtles and tortoises can live an exceptionally long life compared to humans, uh, relatively, some of the longest-lived animals on the entire planet, we're going to take a look at the oldest tortoise that's currently alive on the planet Earth. And that's fascinating. So um, there's a couple of, you know, just like how, like, what's the longest snake? There's kind of like some contention here because especially with this um the oldest confirmed tortoise right now I'll, I'll throw in a tortoise for the running and this tortoise lives on the seychelles archipelago uh off the eastern shore of africa and this tortoise is named jonathan and he is about 190 or 191 years old okay uh he was born sometime circa 1832 all right, so that's a nearly 200-year-old animal that's still alive on this planet. And there's some interesting stuff, some biographical information about, uh, about Jonathan the tortoise here. Uh, he's mainly blind. He has major cataracts, so he can no longer see. He's also lost his sense of smell, though his hearing is still impeccable. Uh, he even kind of loses the ability to detect food. So the people, when they feed him, they kind of have to like guide him to like, okay, Jonathan, here's the food, eat it. They feed him very healthy diet to make sure that he'll live longer, but he's still in pretty good condition. He likes to spend his free time eating, sleeping, and mating. Yeah. <laughs> He's still getting it on. 190-year tortoise. He's like, all right, you know, I imagine it's a very slow process, but way to go, Jonathan. Now, that's Jonathan. 
there's another tortoise that was also born in the Seychelles. So I don't know what it is about the Seychelles archipelago. That's just a place where very long-lived animals live. That was purportedly born in 1750 and then died in 2006, which would have made that tortoise 250 years old. So if that's the situation, then that would be the longest lived tortoise. But that one is not confirmed. See, the problem is, you know, how do you exactly confirm, like, when the tortoise was born? Because it's not like you keep records of every time a tortoise was born. So the reason that Jonathan's is more confirmed, though, is because there was a photo that was found of Jonathan from, like, 1880s. And by looking at the photo and judging, like, the length of, you know, Jonathan's body, you know, he's like, okay, Jonathan in 1886 was probably a fully mature tortoise. And in order to become a fully matured tortoise, you have to age about 50 years. So, like, 50 years is like, okay, you've reached maturity totally. So, by looking at this picture from 1886, they've determined he's at least over 50 years old, which would put his birthday somewhere in the 1830s, okay? So, therefore, he would be easily around 190 years old right now in 2023, um, if not a little bit older. So that's how we could confirm that. But there was no photos of this other this other tortoise, mostly because, you know, this other tortoise was born in the if it was born in the mid 1700s. Uh, I don't think there was any kind of like photograph that you could really take back then unless there was a record kept. But I, it just that's a little bit more like we just don't know. Right. But it's dude, it's just remarkable to me. Like, can you imagine like you could be like um, like uh, like imagine you're like my age, like like 30 years old in 1830. OK, and then there's this tortoise that is born. OK, and it, it, that the tortoise is with you your entire life. And then you have kids and then the tortoise is with the kids and then the grandkids and great grandkids and great, great, great grandkids. You know, seriously, like we're thinking about like, you know, like six, seven, eight generations, something like that. You know, it's just like, yes, my great, 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 great grandpappy had this tortoise and it's still with us. <laughs> um, hope you live a nice long life, Jonathan. Anyway, that's where tortoise or turtle facts today. Hope you enjoyed the video, everybody. Teching signing out.